I'm going to go ahead and take testimony now from um, Mr. Choi Stevens, and then we'll go to you, Morgan Lamandre. Good evening, I guess now, Chair Barrow, um, committee members. Please introduce yourself. And staff. Um, my name is Charlie Stevens. Um, I'm a sophomore at Louisiana State University studying mass communication, and I'm from Baton Rouge. Um, I've met many of you on this committee, um, and I'm proud to be from Baton Rouge and go to LSU. But the systemic failure of LSU to protect its, protect its students, as laid out in the Hush Blackwell report, is extremely depressing. Sitting at the Board of Supervisors meeting last Friday, um, while the university leadership gave lackluster punishments to athletics administrators, felt like a slap in the face, and it still does. It's systemic failures like these that push students like me out of this state. It's not the business climate, it's the lack of regard shown by the state in so many areas, from not adequately funding higher education for my entire adult life, to missing all the warning signs of a systemic failure to protect students at the state's flagship university. I know all of you work every day to improve Louisiana and make it a better place, but we need to up the pace. None of these problems are new. Kansas just hours ago fired Jeff Long after firing Les Miles a couple of days ago. A university 800 miles away is holding their people accountable with a report we paid for and we are doing nothing for. If I may, I want to direct something to President Galligan. Miriam Seeger and Verge Osbury really need to be fired. Um, that, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> it's been an open secret that LSU doesn't protect survivors and it, it's been even before this report. The blame doesn't fall on entirely on LSU, however. The Hush Blackwell report noted that significant budget cuts over the last several years have made it nearly impossible for LSU to meet its commitments. Members of this body failed us, and that is the story that's not being told enough today. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your bravery in being here, and being a part of this process. Ms. Lamandre? Yes, yeah, so Morgan Lamandre with STAR. I feel kind of like a superhero today, um, which I've never been in the in crowd, but it's good to be <laughs> today. But, um, Morgan Lamandre with STAR, so it stands for Sexual Trauma Awareness and Response. And I kept taking notes during everything, and as you know, we've all mentioned, I think we're seven, almost eight hours in, and I'm on the cusp for the BMI to be eligible for my vaccine, so I don't want to miss dinner since I already missed lunch. <laughs> but um, I, I will say the reason people keep saying this is deja vu is because it is deja vu. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking out, and you know, Senator Peterson. I think you'll remember six years ago, the last time I think there was a joint meeting between the Senate Select Committee on Women and Children and the Women's Caucus was about sexual assault. And it was October of 2014. Um, you know, once again, the media is what called everyone to the table. And I will say at the time, I don't know if Senator Peterson re um, remembers this, but I was what I would say more of a new advocate at the Capitol and come in the, you know, tell everyone, I guess, what survivors were experiencing. And I said to her, I said, you know, it's really tough to be an advocate having the knowledge about all the wrongs that are happening to survivors, but without the power to do anything about it. And she asked me who has the power. And at the time I told her I didn't know, but I can say confidently today, it's you who have the power. You have the power to make change, but it does take political courage because people will come back when there are policy recommendations and they will say, we can't do this. We don't have the resources to do this. This is just how it's always been done. And I know this hearing has been focused on LSU and they're in the hot seat, but our, our entire state has continuously failed sexual assault survivors on every level. It is not just in our educational institutions. We are one of only a few states in the country not to fund sexual assault services. And that is where it starts. Our entire culture for this state, it's not just at LSU. It is the state and our response to sexual assault. Anytime a federal law is passed that says that we have to be in compliance with it, we are always in compliance with it after we we basically have become the media's friends because survivors don't feel like they can come forward we tell people we come forward with certain information but 
we're just knocked down. And so the media has been our biggest ally in getting things changed. It started with the rape kit billing back, back, you know, we were supposed to be in compliance with that law in 2005, but it's Louisiana. So we didn't become in compliance with that law until 2015. Every single time. I'm not a state government employee. I have argued to the federal government on our behalf that we deserve additional funding because of a law that we, we did pass. I'm the one who's monitoring it. And so people have said my name and all. It's because I, I actually, you know, STAR, we, we have decided to dedicate resources to making sure Louisiana becomes compliant. That's not our job. That's not our job, it's, it's, it's Louisiana's job. And so on every single level, we continuously pass legislation that is feel good legislation that does not have any enforcement. We have a law in place that says law enforcement or prosecutors cannot polygraph victims. Guess what? It still happens. We have a law that says you can't bill victims for sexual assault exam, it still happens. And in the law, it says there is a remedy but even still now filing a complaint about it, nothing is done. And so I know that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of rhetoric about, oh, we want smaller government. No, the government needs to address these issues. There needs to be oversight. And so, I mean, I, I've made so many things to jot down specific things that have happened, but I'm asking you all to have political courage because it's easy right now. It's easy when survivors are coming before you, but it's harder when the lobbyists come and the lobbyists then tell you, this can't be done, we don't have the resources. It will require political courage. It will require you all to push back and to challenge people when they come to this table or when they come to you behind closed doors and they say, this cannot be done. It can be done. It's about priorities. And our state has never, ever prioritized sexual assault survivors. And we need to change that. So I'm happy to address some specific questions. I mean, I think, like I said, I've, I've made, you know, some notes. There was a set, one of the speakers talked about, you know, she got in trouble about having like a candle or alcohol. Our law already says that educational institutions should have amnesty policies for nonviolent offenses. Why was she charged? I mean, there's so much failure. I think, you know, a couple of the policy recommendations I would say is that survivors, when this happens to them, they have a right to the information that's out there about them. We have laws in place that do not allow survivors to access their police reports, whether it's reported or not, even if it's, it is an ongoing criminal investigation. And I will say, um, you know, Senator, not Senator, um, President Galligan is in the hot seat, and I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say a lot of the fault, nobody is saying his name, and we need to say his name. His name is F. King Alexander. I have personally represented sexual assault survivors where he unilaterally overturned the decision and finding of responsibility for those survivors to have to go back through the process over and over again. And I think that was kind of referenced in the report, just, just because, and I mean, I, I don't think we've also addressed the fact that survivors have been sued as a result of what decisions have happened in the conduct policies. They get sued, well, the AG's office can represent LSU, but there's no one that's out there to represent the survivors. And STAR, because of the grant that we have for um, our legal program, we are not allowed to assist in tort litigation. Survivors are being sued by the perpetrators. And so that's why I think a lot of times they, you know, maybe don't want to, to I guess, address certain punishments with the perpetrators because they know a lot of times they have resources. They will su sue the school. They will sue survivors. So we need to push back on that. We need to protect. There needs to be something in legislation that allows for maybe the AG's office also when there's a suit against the school for the same sort of issue, that there's something that protects those survivors from being sued as well. It's currently happening. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. You know, I keep hearing zero tolerance. 
I want to say for the record, because it was killing me today, zero tolerance is very harmful language to use. Zero tolerance has certain racial implications that, that mean that, you know, it, what we need is swift, effective, and proportionate responses. Zero tolerance makes it harder for survivors to report. And that's why you'll see people who say, well, I don't want to report something because then they may be, it needs to be proportional to whatever occurred. That is also possibly why you're seeing certain investigations where they're saying things are, do not rise to sexual harassment. Because if you come with the mindset that, oh, this is a zero tolerance culture, nobody's going to report. It needs to be proportional to whatever the continuum of, of, of harm is. Those are different things. I mean, and, you know, I will say, I want to say, you know, President Galligan has reached out to Star. He has said to us, he knows that there are things that they need to change. And I'm, I'm happy for that. I will. And I do want to give a shout out to um, President Henderson because he contacted me on Twitter a long time ago before this report. And so I do believe that there are people out there that know that they need um, to take proactive steps. Um, but I, I got to tell you, hearing some of the other university, this is the tip of the iceberg. There is so much out there. I, I told the USA Today reporter, I have enough work for you for over a year. And it's true. I mean, there, the things you, you would, if this is making you sick, there's a lot more out there. And, you know, one of the things in the presentation from Scott Schneider, he said, the people who do this work, you get burnt out. Well, I will say every day of my life, I talk um, to people who have been sexually abused and it's hard. But what's harder is when we're constantly going before the systems and they let us down. It's, it's the second rate, right? And to constantly be coming to the legislature and told, well, that really doesn't happen, right? No, you don't really need this type of legislation. It's bull. Last year, we, I, you know, Representative Landry brought a bill for me. We don't bring bills and, and ask for people to help survivors because something doesn't happen. It's real. It's real. And we need those, that, those bills to be passed. But every single time, it's easy right now. But when different lobbyists from different interest groups come before you and say, this is not going to work for us, you need to push back on that. You need to challenge them because that is why we continue to be last. That is why Louisiana never, never has made any steps forward in really responding adequately to sexual assault survivors. And I'll answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you. I, I, I greatly appreciate you. And thank you for uh, not throwing in the towel and continue to be there, to be a voice and to lead folks through this tumultuous uh, situation. So I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, but I hear you very loud and clear. And not only do I hear you, I'm committing to this. Okay, Representative Fiber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, I've heard you speak on this several times. Um, I have just a quick question because I know today our focus has been on women, but I've been, as I said earlier, interested in the testimony from uh, the gentleman. What is the percentage of male victims versus female victims or survivors uh, who come to you? Do you get male survivors and victims? And, and, and how does that balance out statistically? Yes, yeah, so I would say probably about 10% of the survivors, as far as our clients, are, are men um, or boys. I, like most people, we believe that STAR um, needs to do a better job of reaching out to men and boys because that is an underserved population and that there's, you know, as much shame as there is for anyone to come forward, there's a lot more, uh, barriers as far as feeling like you can come most you know men are told well you shouldn't feel like a victim this you know the men are sexualized in a way that it's like well you would have enjoyed this and and i will say i want to be clear that a lot of times vast majority of the perpetrators are still men 
committing yes, offenses against so, other yeah. men. Yeah. Um, but that makes it even harder because it also does not mean that that, you know, there's different challenges, I would say. But overall, I would say um, as far as clients we see, it's probably a 10 percent boys and men. I want us to remember that as we go forward. And, and again, I appreciate the enhanced role you'll be playing now uh, with LSU, I hope according to the report, I think. Yes, yes and I just want yes. to be clear, too. I am, you know, I, I am definitely one who works more with survivors and does a lot of our policy, policy stuff. I know that we have our CEO and vice president. They're watching. They're the ones who really help to implement some system-wide and um, culture changes. So, Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Fiber. Representative Marcel. Are all the survivors have everyone spoken yet? No, not no. I don't. I'll wait until the end. Okay. Thank you. All right. Susan Mazel. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I just want to thank you, Morgan. I mean, you have touched how many points of contact referenced you today. So the impact you're having is such a necessary voice. And I'm as you're talking, I, I see the effect it's having on, on the survivor back there. So I. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I just want to also comment on something you said, that you said the USA Today reporter, not the advocate, mm -hmm. not a local paper in Louisiana, but USA Today. Yes. And that's sad. I mean, I'm hoping the people in Louisiana that can get the word out will, will I, I mean, I know the role that uh, the reporters have with USA Today, and I'm so thankful. But I'm hoping other people will pick up that torch. And I will preface that on, you know, USA Today has the ability to do real investigative journalism. A lot of survivors do not want to come forward, right, and, and talk directly with reporters. So in order for there to be, I guess, a story without a survivor, a, a witness right to it, um, you know, you need the resources to be able to do the investigation behind it. It seems that USA Today is oh, in a better position to right. be able to do that because unfortunately, when survivors do go through this process, they have no faith. They And then, you know, towards the end, the only thing they have left is their privacy. And I will say that even then, you know, just knowing how it is, the fact that the survivors were able to come up here it just it's one of the the things that does keep me going in this work is because just the thing what it takes for them to stand up here and and that gives me a boost of energy and hope and i will say that the students that are here gen z shout out to them because they do give me hope and op, you know i'm optimistic about what could happen if everyone did have that courage yeah you're right so. right thank you Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Um, Senator Peterson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. You said that you feel like we have the power to do it. Can you just list a couple of things that you'd like to see us do if you were sitting on this side of the dais? And thank you for your leadership. I don't want to take up more time because I could sing your praises because you've been at it for a long time and I'm glad to have been a partner. But can you tell me what else we should be doing? Yes. So, I mean, I think the big thing is that money speaks to people. And when you do hold certain levels of, um, I think it was it Representative Marcel who said on the appropriation committee and all, there is certain ways to hold people accountable. Right now, and, and just an example to go back to my law enforcement thing, nobody wants to do anything that would jeopardize pay for law enforcement. There are way more good apples, right, than bad apples. But you know what gets people to do their training? If you say that if you don't do the training, if you don't comply with this law, your supplemental pay will be cut, right? Okay. So money, I would say whenever there's any bill, if it doesn't have a little bit of a motivation behind it, the enforcement piece to it, then that's where I think, you know, that's, okay. that's where we could start. There's certainly tons of policy things. There will be one, I think, Representative Freeman jumped out. One of the biggest ones that we've been trying to get done is the lease termination bill because you have you see before you all these students on college campuses 
What we have as an issue for survivors is sometimes they will get raped in their apartment and nobody wants to relive and live in the same space that they were sexually assaulted over and over again. Like, you know, it, it takes them back into that to when they were assaulted. So we have a law in Louisiana that allows lease termination for domestic violence. We do not have one for sexual assault survivors. Okay. Representative Freeman is proposing that bill for us. Um, it's, it's a hard bill. It's gonna be controversial, but we want survivors to be able to terminate their lease should okay. they you know, be assaulted and want to go back home or, you okay. know, that th there's policy pieces besides just at the university that I think that people lose sight of, you know, we need support. Um, Louisiana Can you make sure that we get, all, I don't want to go through all, uh, you've given us two examples and I'm glad that Representative Freedom, Freeman's offering them authoring it can you make sure that the chair gets the list because bill filing deadlines are approaching and if members of this committee have or you know the caucus have women's caucus or others uh have um, bills left maybe we can try to take some immediate action and push it yeah. through i i think i had sent an email asking if there was anybody else who had some so <laughs> i definitely if anybody else is hearing or watching okay. please let All me right. know <laughs> well, there we go. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank both of you. Thank you for being here today. And we appreciate uh, your work again, um, Morgan and Charlie. We thank you for your testimony.